Hello, in this class we will look at the famous essay titled Ideological Effects of the Basic Cinematographic Apparatus published in 1970 by the French film theorist Jean-Louis Baudry. Baudry was a French writer and film theorist who lived from 1930 to 2015 and he was best known for two essays. Uh, this one that is ideological effects of the basic cinematographic apparatus which is published in 1970 and one more essay published in 1975 titled the apparatus meta psychological approaches to the impression of reality in cinema he combined the marxist theories of louis althusser most specifically the theory of ideology with the psychoanalytic theories of jacques lacan specifically the concept of the mirror stage. Baudry's work influenced later prominent film theorists like Christian Metz and Laura Mulvey because if you have uh, when you uh, when you read Laura Mulvey you can see that she was also very much influenced by the uh, you know her theory of the gaze was very much influenced by Baudry and also of course this whole concept of mirror stage by Lacan. Uh, Baudry is known for what is what is called apparatus theory, which is a dominant theory in the 1960s and 70s, drawing on Marxism, semiotics and psychoanalytic theory. Apparatus theory holds that cinema is by nature ideological. Cinema is ideological because it seeks to represent a version of reality using the technologies of camera and editing. So, Cinema shows us a lot of things, but it purports or it claims that it is representing reality. Actually, it is representing a version of reality. And in order to represent its own version of reality, it uses the technologies of camera and editing. So, by presenting a version of reality and making us believe that this is actually the reality, that is the ideological work that cinema does. And according to apparatus theory, this ideological work is done precisely by the work of the technological apparatus of cinema. We will come to that as we go into the essay. The essay begins with an introductory section. It doesn't have a title here. I am calling it ideology and instruments. Uh, in the introduction to the essay, Baudry talks about the significance of two optical instruments in the history of science and technology. So from the 14th century onwards, uh, if you look at the history of science and technology, there are two important optical instruments, scientific instruments, which have made a huge change in how we look at optics, how we look at the whole idea of vision, visuality, etc. The first one he says is the telescope which resulted in a decentering of the universe that is away from geocentrism before the telescope was discovered uh, people believed in the heliocentric theory which is that the uh, sorry people believed in the geocentric theory which is that the entire universe rotates or revolves around the earth geo is earth geocentrism believing that the earth is at the center of the universe. But after that, with uh, you know Galileo and Kepler and uh, Copernicus and all those people, we have uh, moved away from geocentrism towards heliocentrism, which is to say that actually the earth is revolving around the sun. And of course, that the earth, sun, all these things, the different uh, galaxies, all these are not there is no specific center to the universe. It's this, neither is the earth the center of the universe nor is the sun, our sun, the center of the universe. All those things have come and the discovery or the invention of the telescope is something that has really helped this decentering of the universe. So scientifically speaking, the telescope has been very important. But when you say that the earth is no longer at the center of the universe, it is also a huge philosophical shift. It is a huge cognitive shift. So that is the decentering that we are most interested in. Now, what is the second instrument? The second instrument is something called the camera obscura. 
which displaces objective reality onto an artificial perspective resulting in the creation of a viewing subject as the active center and origin of meaning. So let us see what the camera obscura is. This is an image of, it's a drawn image of how the camera obscura works. So it is a kind of, uh, you know, an enclosed space, a room or a box where there is a hole in the wall through which light comes from outside. And it is, there's a particular way in which light is projected here so that an image which is outside will be projected on the opposite wall and somebody who is standing in front of that wall will be able to see the image that is projected from outside. And this camera obscura is supposed to be the, uh, the camera obscura is supposed to be the uh, predecessor of the modern camera, the either the, uh, you know, the film camera or the movie camera. And what the camera obscura does is there was a lack of a fixed center, right? Because of the invention of the telescope, uh, we have undergone this cognitive test whereby, uh, cognitive, uh, sorry, we have undergone this, you know, cognitive shift whereby we no longer believe in the fixed locus, which was the earth earlier. So now it is all a free floating thing and it is possible to create a new fixed locus, a new center. And that is in some sense, again, cognitively, that is what the camera obscura does. The new locus or the new center that the camera obscura creates is called the subject or the viewing subject, the subject who views. Now, who is this viewing subject? It's very important to understand that. You know, you, if you look at this image, you can see a person who is standing here. But this person is not actually the viewing subject. We think because this person is seeing the image, this person is the viewing subject. But the viewing subject is not a person, but rather a position. Whoever stands in that position will be able to see that image. If you stand anywhere else, you may not be able to see that image. Therefore, the viewing subject is a new position, a new location, a new center for visuality that is produced by the, this technology called camera obscura. Now, since these instruments, that is the um, telescope and the camera obscura, since these instruments are technical ones or scientific ones, one would expect them to contribute to the creation of what Althusser calls a knowledge effect. But instead they conceal knowledge and result in the creation of an ideological effect. So uh, the camera, not just the camera obscura, but also the uh, film camera and the movie camera, the still uh, photographic camera and the movie camera, all these are technical instruments, scientific instruments. So we believe that science is objective. Science will leave us towards facts and towards knowledge. But rather, instead of creating more knowledge, instead of uh, taking us towards some kind of objective reality that is true in itself, what these instruments actually do in photography and in cinema, much more so in cinema, as Baudre will argue, is that they conceal knowledge. Cinema doesn't show us the actual objective reality out there. It shows us, as I mentioned earlier, a version of that reality that is, uh, you know, uh, stitched together using many technologies and it presents it to us as if that is actually objective reality. And therefore, what is created here is an ideological effect rather than a knowledge effect. We don't know reality. Instead, true knowledge is hidden from us, concealed from us. And what we have instead is an ideological effect. And this ideological effect is produced precisely by the concealment of the technological base. That is the concealment or the hiding of the apparatus. Again, you can see that he is drawing on Marxist uh, notions like, you know, technological base as in base superstructure where ideology is part of the superstructure and technology is part of the base. But this technological base is precisely what results in the, what helps in the 
construction of this ideological effect and the ideological effect can only survive it can only become powerful if people don't realize that they are being fooled by ideology if you know that this particular technology is creating that ideology then you will not be fooled by ideology anymore so in order to completely have you know ideology sway over people we need to conceal or hide the work the process of the technological base that is the cinematographic apparatus then in the next section body go goes on to talk about what exactly is the work of the cinematographic apparatus between objective reality and the camera which is a site of inscription and between inscription and the projection are situated certain operations a work which has as a result a finished product this is how bodri explains the work of the cinematographic apparatus so there is a objective reality that is out there that objective reality is you know the reality around us which we are trying to capture using the camera and then there is a camera which is a site of inscription we are trying to inscribe the objective reality using the technology of the camera so that is one thing that is happening there there is a reality there is a capturing of that reality between the camera and a certain process is happening there and secondly between inscription and projection so there is a camera which has captured reality in the form of films film reels and then there is a projection which projects this film reel and shows it to us on a screen but there is also a lot of work that goes on between these two uh, stages between capturing through camera and projection on the screen which is precisely the work of editing right these two works actually combined together can be called the work of the cinematographic apparatus so there is capturing by camera which is a technological process and there is an editing between the camera and the projection and of course there is also the uh, technology of projecting onto a screen but the first two this is where the work of the cinematographic apparatus completely happens some terms that he uses here are the first one there are two stages that uh, bodri mentions here the first one is called decoupage which means the breakdown of shots before filming and this is at the level of language before you film uh, say you don't just go with a camera and then you just turn on the camera and film whatever comes in front of the camera you plan the scene you plan where every element is supposed to be you plan the dialogues you plan the movements of the characters you plan the breakdown of the shots so which shot should come first then which shot how many shots should this one scene be broken down into all this is planned before the shooting happens and this planning happens at the level of language because it is it's planning it's at the level of thought it's at the level of language it's at the, at the level of the script you write it down then the next stage is that of montage which is you have already studied montage which is an editing technique that combines disparate shots and montage happens at the level of image so decoupage happens at the level of language breaking down the shots before filming and then later during editing we have montage that is combining these broken down disparate separate shots into a continuity and this montage happens at the level of image the camera is the instrument which mutates or changes the signifying material from language to image so whatever we had at the level of language the idea the plan the script that this is how we are going to shoot is mutated into image by the work of the camera because when you edit the image that is the image that has been produced by the camera so the image actually is produced from the raw material of language through camera now finally between the finished product that is film a uh, commodity with exchange value and its consumption that is its use value is another set of instruments the projector and the screen so it is not just enough that you uh, capture the film and then you edit the film and then you make it into a proper film reel then that film is it is a proper finished commodity it has exchange value 
but it has use value only when it is consumed that means when it is finally projected in a theater and it is watched by the audience the audience who pays money to go and watch the film in the theater are the ones who finally consume and finally make use of the use value of this finished product called the film now let us look at a simple image this is not in the essay but uh, this is a kind of image that you can easily find online this is how the work of the cinematographic apparatus can be represented graphically so if you begin from the top right we have objective reality and uh, let us just first look at the uh, not the broken lines but the proper straight lines objective reality and then from there if you see the arrow it moves to scenario and decoupage so when we know this is the objective reality we are going to uh, shoot first we create a scenario we create the scenes the um, script and then we plan the decoupage how to break down the shots from there the arrow leads to film stock or camera and sound recording so there once you have the shots broken down then you shoot it using the camera you shoot it using technologies like uh, sound recording and camera from there again the arrow moves to montage which is the editing process at the editing table you cut certain film reels you uh, you know join them together etc and from montage the next is of course once you have a proper film reel a full film reel that has been edited and stitched back together glued back together then you move on to the projector or the actual film so this is film reel for film roll actually the film reel actually goes to the projector from there we have it being projected towards the screen on the uh, bottom right there is a projection in the screen and that projection is viewed by the spectator so from objective reality to the spectator it should actually have been a much simpler it should have been a direct uh, you know it should have been a more direct process because we look at objective reality we try to understand it and we believe that any kind of scientific instrument is supposed to only make that process easier but here if you look at it there are so many processes that ultimately when by the time objective reality reaches the spectator it has gone through so much processing it has gone through so much work that what the spectator gets is not exactly objective reality but a version of it an ideological effect of the uh, which is an ideological effect of the work of the cinematographic apparatus the next section is called the eye of the subject and this is again something very interesting that he talks about the film camera which is fabricated on the model of the camera obscura which we have mentioned earlier the film camera permits the construction of an image analogous to the perspective projections developed during the italian renaissance so during the italian renaissance there was a huge revolution in painting mainly because of this idea of perspective perspective we know how who looks at it from where from what vantage point or from what point do you look at something that is called our perspective and in terms of visual art especially in painting uh, perspective is very important because you know uh, painting is basically it shows you a still image and it depends actually in renaissance art especially it depends where you stand and look at that art and that is very important there is always one position that you should occupy in front of that painting if you are to get the full effect of that painting and this perspective is something you can look up something called linear perspective on the internet and you will find that now those of you who are artists will know this already but you know if you look at uh, some images or some write ups about linear perspective in renaissance art you will see a very scientific way in which paper or that canvas has been broken up into grids and how they very painstakingly uh, you know uh, create this perspective the important thing is that this uh, coming of perspective in renaissance art is opposed to what we had in ancient greek art 
the example he gives is the stage where you know the greek in the greek art there is no idea that you have to sit right in front of the stage to get the in greek theater there's no idea that you have to sit right in front of the theater uh, in front of the stage but rather you can be at different points so the perspective there is not a fixed or centralized one whereas in renaissance art there is an imagination of a centered space and the center of the space coincides with the eye of the subject and as i mentioned earlier with camera obscura please keep in mind that the subject is not a person but a position which a person should occupy in order to get a certain effect the fixed point according to which all visualized objects are organized in a frame is precisely the position of the viewing subject so there is a particular position uh, you can in, you know very simplistically one might think that this is the position of the artist who created the uh, that particular painting but it's not exactly true because the artist creates that painting from that particular perspective because the artist is already imagining that a spectator will come and stand at this position and this is the effect i want to give that spectator so it's a kind of it's it's not like the artist is responsible for this it is the the subject here the viewing subject is not even the artist it is an imaginary position that the artist first occupies in order to paint and the spectator is later supposed to come and occupy in order to uh, comprehend this painting in order to appreciate this painting the ideological function of the camera is precisely in the creation of the idea of a whole subject through the artificial construction of a total vision so rather than thinking that everything around us objective reality that is all around us is decentered which is a very discomforting kind of uh, idea rather if we believe that there is one fixed position from which we can make sense of the entire objective reality around us then that also reflects back on us and makes us think that we who are standing here are not fractured fragmented people but rather because we can see a totality because we can see a the objective reality as a kind of whole which has a coherent meaning then we too are coherent cohesive people our sub- subjectivity is not fragmented is not fractured but is rather whole but that is also a misunderstanding and this is something we will come to towards the end of this essay when uh, bodri draws on the idea of the mirror stage in lakan but this is precisely what the ideological function of the camera is by presenting us with something that looks whole look like a holistic or a coherent image of the material universe around us the camera makes us believe that we occupy the perfect uh, subject position and therefore we are proper whole subjects when actually we are not neither is objective reality a whole nor are we whole all of us we have a lack as lacan would say um, a certain lack within us which fragments us and the reality uh, is also completely decentered there is no one way of making meaning out of it but the camera makes us believe that all this is possible and uh we will continue this but for now just look at this one uh, image this is the last supper by leonardo da vinci and this is an example of how linear perspective is used in renaissance art you can see that there is a particular figure at the center in this of course it is the figure of christ in other uh, images it will be whatever is the focus of the point, uh, of the painting and so christ here is the focal point and we can see rays radiating from all these from that focal point outwards and we can see the something called a horizon line in the very middle a horizontal line which is labeled here as horizon line and it is at the very middle of the horizon line or at the intersection of all these equal lines that we have the focal point which is the figure of christ here and if you occupy a certain 
the very fact that this painting is made in this way if you look at all these lines you can also see the symmetry the absolute symmetry of the painting on both sides of christ above and below there is perfect symmetry so that when you stand in a particular position where you can see this painting with exactly this focus then you feel that actually yeah, there you are in the position of the viewing subject this is the imaginary position that has been created for you and the creation of that position is through the technologies of painting similarly cinema also uses its own technologies in order to create a viewing position for the viewing subject we will continue this in the next video thank you